for how our future relationship would look in terms of security. Whether you voted to leave or remain, is this what you wanted to hear from Mrs. May? Please call us on 0345 6060 text 84850, uh, or you can tweet me at LBC. I'm broadcasting from Somerset. Don't go anywhere, but get in touch. H Hello. Good morning. This is Jacob Rees-Mogg um, for the LBC, the London Broadcasting Corporation, but actually I'm in Somerset. There is a fire going, the snowdrops are out, a few brave tulip, uh, d daffodils even, are appearing in the garden, a slightly grey day, but as always, Somerset is the perfect place to be. Uh, thank you for joining me. You can actually watch me live on Facebook if you're very technologically sophisticated, but if, like me, you're happier on a wind-up wireless, you can listen to me on that as well. What we're going to be discussing this morning to start with uh, is Theresa May's speech yesterday in Munich. It was a very important speech on the issue of cooperation with the European Union once we've left on security and foreign policy. Mrs. May, of course, as a very long-serving Home Secretary, has a particular expertise in this area. She was involved in the security issues around the European arrest warrant and the opt-in and opt-out that happened uh, a few years ago to decide which bits of European security policy we would cooperate and which bits we'd do independently. But her speech set out how she thought we would do it in future, and it had some very important lines. She challenged the EU to say that their political doctrine and ideology could have real damaging consequences for the security of all our people in the UK and the EU. She's telling them not to put ideology ahead of getting a deal that allows us to cooperate. And she also said that we must be respectful of the sovereignty of both the UK and the EU's legal orders. So, for example, when participating in EU agencies, the UK will respect the remit of the European Court of Justice. That has raised some questions, though I think it's reasonably clear, because she went on to say that as a third country, we will have our own sovereign legal order. Um, it's very interesting the way this is developing. It's a clear Brexit that Mrs May is setting out, but one with close cooperation. What she seems to want is that the structures that are in place now that have worked should be maintained, but they should be done on a basis of international cooperation in the way the United Kingdom operates with other third countries. So we have a very successful or very efficient uh, extradition treaty with the United States. But the United States extraditions to the UK are determined by the U US courts, and the um, UK extraditions to the US are determined by the UK courts. And Mrs May seems to be looking for something similar in terms of how we approach our future relations uh, with the European Union. She emphasizes that we will be taking back control of our foreign policy, that with a seat on the United Nations, foreign policy will be set in the UK for the UK. Now, that obviously doesn't mean that we won't continue to cooperate with our allies. That will be something that we do, and indeed is something that we have done, uh, not just for decades, but for hundreds of years. All sensible countries cooperate uh, with their allies. But the Prime Minister is making it clear that we will be independent of the official structures of the European Union in this respect, so that the occasion uh, in 2003 when, for example, a British representative had to be present at a conference with Robert Mugabe against our normal policy will not recur. Um, Mrs May has really set this out, I think, very clearly, and it is her area of particular expertise, but it may be worth looking at what she said or hearing what she said, and this is what the Prime Minister, speaking in Munich about security after we leave the EU, did say, or a brief clip. Changing the structures by which we work together should not mean we lose sight of our common aim, the protection of our people and the advance of our common interests across the world. So as we leave the EU and forge a new path for ourselves in the world, the UK is just as committed to Europe's security in the future as we have been in the past. Europe's security is our security. And that is why I've said, and I say again today, that the United Kingdom is unconditionally committed to maintaining it. The challenge for all of us today is finding the way to work together through a deep and special partnership between the UK and the EU to retain the cooperation that we have built 
and go further in meeting the evolving threats we face together. This cannot be a time when any of us allow competition between partners, rigid institutional restrictions or deep-seated ideology to inhibit our cooperation and jeopardise the security of our citizens. That was Theresa May speaking yesterday in Munich, and this is Jacob Rees-Mogg. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage. Uh, last time I did it for James O'Brien, so uh, it's now once for the left and once for the right. Um, do get in touch. You can call on 0345 6060 973. You can text on 84850, or you can tweet at LBC. We're discussing Mrs. May's Munich speech yesterday, and we've just had a clip from her. Um, I accept that I am not as sound a Eurosceptic as Nigel Farage is, and so some of you who are expecting to hear him may think you've got a lightweight on, somebody who's weak on leaving the European Union, but I'm not too weak on it. And I actually think this speech is very welcome. I think the Prime Minister has set out a very clear position that Eurosceptics can be happy with. And there are two things I would like to highlight. One is the issue of the European Court of Justice. Because people have been in touch with me to say, are we remaining under the European Court of Justice when the Prime Minister said we would respect the remit of the European Court of Justice in EU agencies? And my answer to that is no. If you're dealing with a foreign agency, that foreign agency is obviously subject to the courts of that foreign power. So if British law enforcement has a relationship uh, with the FBI, the FBI, the American Federal Bureau of Investigation, is obviously subject to the US courts in how it operates. And that would be similar in our cooperation with EU institutions. That is the normal state of affairs. But the other important thing I think is worth highlighting is brought out very clearly by the distinguished political commentator uh, Tim Shipman in the Sunday Times this morning when he read into the speech that it was a clear declaration that uh, we would pull out of the common foreign and security policy giving the UK full control of diplomacy, peacemaking, defence and overseas aid for the first time in 26 years. That is a genuine taking back of control. And that's why I want to discuss it with you to see whether I am being a bit soft and Nigel would be tougher if he were on, or whether you think that what I've got to say is broadly right. If you voted leave or remain, please get in touch. Your calls will be very welcome. Uh, and we'd like to go first to Peter in Wimbledon, if you're there, Peter, can can you hear me? Yes, very good morning. Is Peter, there? Good morning. What I'd like to say is um, the issues, like all the other issues, uh, unfortunately, before the referendum took place, uh, neither yourself nor people on the Remain side side actually explained enough in depth to the people of Britain what the consequences of leaving EU will be, and. Uh, Issues like customs union, uh, single market, having Irish border reinstated, our uh, financial sector losing EU trading passports, and issues of security, which are very important to this country. People voted blindly on a lot of things, uh, hoping they're going to be able to have their cake and eat it. And uh, unfortunately, if you want to have a deep relationship with the European Union, it's better staying within the European Union. And when you said about the European Court of Justice, it's important to have to work under one legal framework. Should we have disputes uh, between European agencies and ourselves, then there should be one court who are going to make a final decision who's right, who's wrong. Our agency will operate under, under British law. European agency will operate under European law. But what's going to happen when we're going to have disputes between two agencies or, or any kind of discrepancies? Because obviously we're going to have our legal framework, they're going to have their legal framework. Um, and I well, just can't understand how okay. it works. I think the, the point, my point is that you guys, you know, you kind of kept hidden quite a lot of facts about leaving European Union and British and led British public blindly towards this kind of Brexit mass disaster. Uh, I wonder how much attention you paid to the referendum debate, because you say that nobody knew we were leaving the single market of the customs union. Uh, David Cameron told everybody that a vote to leave would be out of the single market and the customs union, and he accused Brexiteers uh, of wanting us to be in a relationship with Europe akin to Albania. So that was very clear to people. And I think one of the key parts of Mrs. May's speech yesterday is her generosity to the EU. She's saying, we will never do anything that will reduce the security of our neighbours and of our friends. Don't you think that's an important starting point? 
Uh, it's very important as well, sorry, point. And, and, and the security is uh, one we can be proud of. Our security services where, where we can be proud of. And well, unfortunately, you know, we can't have um, the same relationship we had while we were above the European Union. And that applies to all aspects of our life, not only security. As I said before, it's customs union, single market. And but we don't want... A lot of leading Brexiteers like Daniel Hannan were saying that no one questions our membership in a single market. And it's, it turned out to be not true. And you guys never talked about customs union, about having Irish border. Well, I did, actually. I, I talked about the customs union and the, and the Irish uh, border is going to remain open. That's one of the key commitments of both sides. But the point well, is we voted to leave well. and that means, that means a different relationship with the European Union. That was what the whole vote to leave was about. Uh, but thank you very much for calling. I'm looking forward to lots of other calls. You're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage. It is now 10.14 and 45 seconds, and we're just going to have a few messages. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg for LBC, leading Britain's conversation. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage, and I'm hoping lots of you will ring up on this Sunday morning on 0345 6060 973 or send a text on 84850, tweet at LBC, or you can even watch on Facebook. But I've got a new caller coming in. We're discussing Mrs May's speech in Munich yesterday, and I'm glad to say a fellow Somerset man is calling in. So, Mike in Taunton, uh, are you there? Good morning, Jacob. Yes, I am. Good morning, Mike. Thank you for calling. Um, a two-part question, Jacob. Well, firstly, can I say thank you very much for everything that you're doing uh, it's very, very important um, what you and Nigel and the rest are doing. Um, my question is a two-part question, very quickly. Um, do you see Mrs May's speech um, as delivering the Brexit? It's a big-picture question. Is the Brexit that the millions of us who voted for in the referendum, is that going to be delivered? We know what we voted for. We voted for an independent Britain. Is that, following Mrs May's speech, is that going to be delivered? And the second part to my question is, have you seen QAnon post-774? I think you would be very interested in it. Well, the answer to the second question is, no, I haven't seen that post. Uh, but the answer to the first question is, I think yesterday's speech indicated everything was going in the right direction. There's this important set of speeches from leading ministers... I thought Boris Johnson, as Foreign Secretary, set out a very positive view of Brexit, which we need to remind ourselves about, that it is positive, that there are real economic opportunities from leading and being free uh, of EU regulation. And I absolutely agree with your point that people knew what they were voting for, that British electorate is highly sophisticated and understands these issues. And there's a slightly condescending metropolitan view that people like us, rural d dwellers, didn't know what we were doing. And everyone I met in the rural areas did know what they were doing. And so I'm encouraged by yesterday, I, I think being clear that we will be out of the European Court of Justice uh, in relation to our security arrangements uh, is the right sign to be giving. And being out of the corin common foreign um, and security policy is, again, absolutely what we ought to be doing. It is taking back control. Uh, and in my view, taking back control is what people voted for. Do you agree? Um, I do, I do, and I'm glad Excellent. to hear that you're optimistic because you're closer to it than the rest of us. But please do look at QAnon post 774. If you don't know QAnon, I urge everyone to get familiar with QAnon. Okay. This is more important than it's to do with Brexit, and uh, this is a global movement. It's not just a Brexit movement. This is Donald Trump. This is much, much bigger than just Brexit. All right. Well, I won't give it an endorsement because I haven't seen it, but thank you, and thank you for the wisdom of Somerset, which is very much appreciated. Now, we've been getting some texts in. Uh, there's one from George in Luton, uh, where there's a famous airport, and it says, Dear Jacob, Theresa May's speech. Personally, I found it worrying that she stated that the EU arrest warrant will still be enforceable in the UK. Surely that means that the European Court will still have supremacy over UK courts. Perhaps you could explain a little further. Well, thank you for that question. I, I think it is a key point to raise. My understanding is that when the UK issues an arrest warrant to be enforced in continental Europe, that will come under the auspices of the European Court of Justice when it's enforced in continental Europe. 
but that if a European country or EU member state country issues an arrest warrant that will be applied in the UK, when it is applied in the UK, that will be under UK court jurisdiction. It will be exactly the same as if we asked to arrest somebody in the United States. The operation of it in the States will be under US law, but in the UK under UK law. So I hope that's some reassurance, but it is a crucial point, because I agree with you, if it were the case that the arrest warrant in the UK was subject to the ECJ, that would mean they had a jurisdiction that I would think would be improper. Um, Oh dear, there's one speech from Sam at Worthing. Now, now Worthing is in Sussex, which isn't Somerset, so we all have to forgive Sussex for sending in the view that the speech was useless. Uh, the reality is nothing will change fundamentally, and you know it. Well, I, I don't agree. Uh, Brexit in name only will be delivered. In my parenthesis, that would be disastrous. Close parenthesis. Uh, you will run out of road of lies uh, in March 2019. Well, that's Sam of Worthing's view. Uh, I must confess I don't agree, but Sam, thank you for getting in touch and for the clarity of your thought. Everyone knows where you stand um, uh, and uh, have a feeling you may be a member of UKIP, though you may think even they're not sound enough. But now I'd like to go to Steve in Rickmansworth. Uh, Steve, are you there and can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Jacob. Thank you for taking my call. Good morning. No, it's a pleasure. Morning, thank Steve. you for calling. No, um, I've been watching you for a few what? years now, Jacob, and um, I really like you. I trust you. I think you're the most honest politician there is. just want to say that. Um, and I just want to thank you for all the work you've done. Well, that's really kind of you. What a nice call to make. Uh, and thank you for calling on a Sunday morning. It's a good start to the week to have such a friendly call. Uh, and what do you think of Mrs May's speech in Munich? Do you think she's hit the right tone? Uh, I hope so. I hope. I don't... I, d I like Theresa May. <clears throat> I don't think she's got our interest um, at heart. Uh, I think it's very difficult to change your mind. It's, and and I, we've all been through this, these, these situations in life where we have to go down a path we don't want to go. And I think she's, that, that's the path. She's going down a path that she doesn't believe in. I think there's only one prime minister that we need, and I'm speaking to him now on the phone. I know, you'd, I know you're, you're um, very shy about it, but we all love you, Jacob. Honestly, we do. Um, you're a very popular man. We, there's nothing. The best thing about you, Jacob, is there's nothing on you, and that can't be said for most politicians. So I just want to tell you that we love you, and we, we, we are pr I pray that you become my prime minister, and I would love to help you as much as I can. That's all I need to say. Uh, well, That's what I want to say to you, Jacob, because I don't want to get into the other um, subject because I don't know enough about it. But I, I, we really love you, Jacob, and, 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 and this is not just me. This is the whole, whole of, the, of Great Britain. Well, Steve, thank you very much. That's enormously flattering. Uh, and I just reassure people that we're not, in fact, related, and I didn't pay you to call in. But I'm, I'm very grateful for, for, for your um, endorsement. But I'm, as you know, very much supporting Mrs May and reinvigorated support after yesterday's, I think, excellent speech. Uh, do please keep on sending in your calls on 0345 6060 973 uh, or texts. We've got a quite lengthy text that's come in um, on the Conservative Party, claiming it's lost its identity, and it's getting almost biblical. A flock of sheep in the wilderness in need of a shepherd. Oh, then thinks I'm the shepherd. I, I'm not very agricultural, really. I do have a few sheep in Somerset. We keep three Jacob sheep to keep the grass down, um, uh, which you can't hear buying away in the field because they're just out of range. Um, but that's a very kind... I can't see who this text is from, uh, but it says the Liberal vocal will attack my belief, which indeed they will, because it's a democracy, um, and that uh, we're at a crossroads. Well, it's saying I should lead the country, or Jeremy Corbyn will be Prime Minister. I think both are unlikely. Let's back Mrs May, because I think she's the person who can give us the leadership we need. But thank you for that anonymous, if somewhat embarrassingly flattering text. Um, now, I'd like to go to Elizabeth in Pinner. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, hello. Yes. Hello. Thank, thank you for you. calling. Um, well, I, I'm not a Tory, Jacob. Sorry, no disrespect. Um, That's all right. I understand Mrs May. I like the fact that Mrs May comes from a working class background. It's what the Tory party needs. And every prime minister, Europe has been their undoing. I voted to stay because especially when it comes to issues like security, and, sh and information sharing, especially with all the recent um, incidents with terror attacks. 
on the continent as well as in the UK. I think it was very, I think Theresa May has got the tone totally right. Even though I am not a conservative supporter, I just think it is a big mistake to leave because underneath we're all European, none of us are pure English. I just think that. You know, I always predicted, I'm even on YouTube saying Britain without borders. I always predicted that we'll never come out totally, that we'll always end up on the fringes and having to buy our way into possibly the single market, possibly the um, ECJ. But the European arrest warrant, like you say, should stay and we should have very close ties uh, for information sharing and security, especially with the recent terror attacks. Well, don't you think that's what Mrs May was offering in a generous offer to the European Union to say yes, that though we won't be a member... Yes, yes I uh, do. Uh, can I, I think it's so we should have that membership, but there are people maybe in the Tory party that ain't going to like that whatsoever. Do you think so? Because, I mean, I'm reasonably Eurosceptic, and I'm happy with the speech. I think it's a good speech. You think it's a good speech. And can I thank you for calling? I'm really pleased that somebody who backed Remain has called in to give some balance to this debate. So I appreciate that, and somebody who isn't a, a Tory. But if it's united the two of us, do you think that's actually quite good for the country and will help bring us back together? Um, sorry, Jacob, no disrespect to you. OK. Well, uh, thank you very much for calling anyway. You're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC, which stands for Leading Britain's Conversation, not, as I said before, the London Broadcasting Company, because we're in Somerset. Uh, and I'm standing in for Nigel Farage. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, for LBC, Leading Britain's Conversation uh, from Somerset, and I'm standing in for Nigel Farage, one former leader of UKIP, but this programme specialises in former leaders of UKIP, and I'm very glad to say that Henry Bolton will be joining us uh, after 11 o'clock to have a discussion on what's happening to that party. In the meantime, we're discussing Mrs May's speech in Munich yesterday, what she said about security policy, the arrest warrant, how we cooperate with our friends in Europe when we're not any longer a member of the European Union. Calls are coming through thick and fast, but you can add your name to the list if you call 0345 6060973, -60 and you can watch on Facebook, and I can look directly at a little camera that I believe is beaming this to people glued to their computer screens watching it live on Facebook. You can text on 84850 or tweet at LBC. So it's Mrs May's speech in Munich. Is it what we wanted to hear? Is it something leavers and remainers can unite over and support as it sets out a generous policy of cooperation, uh, but one that we take back control, no longer subject to the ECJ and no longer part of the common foreign security policy with the requirements that come with it? I'd now like to go, if I may, to Charles in Birmingham. Charles, are you there from the United Kingdom's second city? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Morning. I do watch Mrs May's speeches, and yesterday I was not impressed because, to me, she had put something on the table that shouldn't even be on the table. It should be a given, and that is security. That shouldn't even be in the negotiations. It shouldn't be discussed. It should automatically be there, no matter what, for any country. Now she's put this on the table. The EU will use this as a as a bargaining chip to get more what they want. Every time she does a speech and put something on the table, the EU use it against us. We should have no more speeches. She should go to internal negotiations with what she wants privately before, because when she walks in, they know what she wants, and they use it as a bargaining chip. But security, no matter what, shouldn't it be on the table, shouldn't it be discussed. It should be a standard for any country, especially the world we well, live in right now. Can I quote a bit of Mrs May's speech to you? Because I think yes. you agree with her, and she agrees with you. She said... Europe's security is our security, and that is why I have said, and I say again today, that the United Kingdom is unconditionally committed to maintaining it. And don't you think that was the right and generous tone for her to take? Yes, but the EU, you, you and I know the EU, especially the two we're dealing with, will say, OK, you want it unconditionally, but we want own conditions. You know what they're like, and that's what they will do. Whatever we put, they uh, always put conditions on it, and that is the problem well, I'm, saying anything in the open before you go and speak to them. You must keep it close but, to your test and then speak to them later. 
But don't you think that as we contribute more to their security than vice versa, I mean, it's another point Mrs May makes in her speech mm -hmm. that um, the UK arrests eight people on a European arrest warrant for every one that we issue to other member states, so that we're the pretty much biggest individual contributor to European security, so they need us rather more than we need them. Yes, but the, the 27 might see it that way, each individual leader, but these two don't see it that way. Barnier and Juncker see it as a bargaining chip, and, and that is the problem with them. If you were doing with each individual country leader, yes, you could say, yes, we'll agree this, but you're dealing with two very stubborn men that want everything their own way and to give us nothing, and that is a problem well, I have. Well, Charles, I think you cut through to the heart of the matter. I think that's a really important point, uh, and that the 27 individual leaders are more reasonable than the EU ideologues, and I think that's why it's important uh, Mrs May set out that we should get an agreement regardless of this hardline ideology in favour of a European Union superstate, which Mr Juncker denied, but he must be forgetting the five presidents' report that set out a European su superstate uh, a couple of years ago. Um, thank you for calling. Before I go to the next caller, we've had some people saying they can hear some crackling in the background. Now, this is not a problem with the line or the um, satellite signal coming from Somerset. It's the fire. During the adverts, we put a couple of logs on the fire, and the new logs are sparkling and crackling away. So I hope it doesn't disturb you too much. Um, and uh, we'll now go to Lorraine in Chelmsford, if she's there, to hear what she's got to say about Mrs May's Munich speech. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Jacob. How lovely to speak to you. Um, I am a lever. <laughs> I will tell you that now. Good, thank you. Um, my um, big concern is I believe that we're getting involved in um, EU integration with regards to our military um, uh, and also the procurement. I believe Germany wants to do the manufacturing um, of all weaponry, etc. Um, I don't know if you've seen Veterans for Britain's website. But I, I know think, of it, yes. Yeah, I, I think you should look at that because um, I think we're having the wall pulled over our eyes. I don't think the intention is of our civil servants, and Mrs May, um, that we will be independent um, military. And I'm really, I'm really cross about that because as far as I'm concerned, who controls the military con controls the country. I mean, I agree with you that, that the control of the military is absolutely essential. I, I get the impression from what Mrs May has been saying that she views NATO as being more important than the European Union in this regard, and that once absolutely. we've left, we won't, be, we, we won't be subject to any EU command structures. So we'll cooperate, and even in procurement, there are some cost advantages in uh, cooperating with other countries, and we do it a great deal with the United States. So I wonder if that's some reassurance for you that outside the EU will be in a much better position uh, to avoid the single European army. Mm -hmm. Well, since November 2016, um, Britain has taken place in five meetings in the EU, in the EU regards to our military and our finance and our manufacturing. You know, I think that she's planning and our civil servants are planning on actually integrating our military to a certain extent. And I'm not happy about that. I think we should be independent completely and align with NATO with that. Well, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you. Nation. We're also a very proud but, nation. You know, our military service has, has always been something of pride um, for a lot well, of Lorraine, reasons. I agree with you that NATO is the key to our defence, and thank you very much for, for calling. I think what you've said will um, ring of chord with many people. But I'd now like to go to Chris in Teesside. Uh, Chris, uh, what did you think of Mrs May's Munich speech? Did you think it uh, hit the spot, or, or do you have some concerns? Um, I, I think in terms of the speech, I think the speech was very... Uh, it was what you'd expect from so, such, a, such a summit. Um, and I think on generally on the issue of security, the, what, the one thing I wanted to pick up on, and it's something that you alluded to earlier, about the Irish border. Now, there's many, many issues there. But I just, I still don't quite understand. On the issue of security, and also probably the biggest issue of um, Brexit, immigration, nobody wants a hard border. Um, and you said there's been guarantees made on the Irish border. 
But I just don't understand on a security front, an immigration front, how you can not have a hard border and retain the basically the premise of what people want in terms of um, Britain coming out of the EU. Because, you know, the DUP don't want Northern Ireland to have the same deal as the rest of the UK. Yeah. They don't want a hard border in the Irish Sea. Um, and I just... I. There's so many things about that dynamic that I just do not understand, and I don't think there's clarity on it. Um, and I think it falls okay, well, under the security issue as well. Um, can I try and give you some some reassurance um, on on the issue of immigration? The Republic of Ireland isn't a member of Schengen, uh, and therefore there are controls on people going into the Republic of Ireland. And that immigration controls in relation to work or renting a house or opening a bank account take place with the employer the landlord and with the bank. So that if you want to come into the country and work illegally after we've left from Europe or anywhere else in the world, you might just as well come in through Heathrow on a tourist visa and overstay. But there will be no greater risk of having an open border between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. And that in terms of trade, we'll be an independent country and it will be up to us to say that we don't actually want to put any tariffs on Irish goods. We don't want to put any non-tariff barriers on Irish goods, and therefore we will be free to maintain the border. So both from a security immigration point of view and from a customs point of view, there's a very straightforward solution. And then you're pushing it back to the EU and the Republic of Ireland to say, we don't want a border, do you? And the Republic of Ireland certainly doesn't, and therefore you're just left with the EU ideologues, and you have to say to them, this is not in anybody's interests. So I think the Irish border so problem is, is very soluble. One quick text. Um, somebody asking me to clarify the better bill. I assume it means the Brexit bill. Uh, Mrs May says it's 30 to 40 billion, but this figure is arrived after deducting 53 billion that the EU owes us. What is the bill and how is it arrived at? It's arrived at uh, through making contributions to the end of the current financial period at the end of 2020 and then committed but unspent EU money. So it's basically where it comes from. I happen to think it's too high. But now it's um, time to go uh, over to uh, uh, the messages and you're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC standing in for Nigel Farage. Well, welcome back. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, standing in for Nigel Farage, and we're discussing uh, Mrs May's Munich speech yesterday, and we've had lots of people getting in touch, and people can watch live on Facebook if they want to, and we've had a text from a black taxi driver, and as a rule, I will always hear the views of taxi drivers, as uh, Disraeli called them the gondoliers of London, so thank you for getting in touch, and he says that he's relieved Mrs May didn't use her speech to get support for Uber, uh, which he thinks is disgraceful uh, and is decimating the taxi service by its corruption. So thank you for that view from one of London's fine taxi drivers. What a British sight they are. I always feel proud to be British when I see a taxi and very often relieved with that yellow light gleaming in the distance when it's raining and you hope that nobody will get it before you. But I want to go, in fact, to Daniel in Stoke Newington uh, to hear what he's got to say about Mrs May's speech. Daniel, are you there? Hello, Jacob. How are you? Can you hear me? Well, thank you. And you? Yeah, not too bad. Loud and clear, yes. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful. Um, so, I, I'm a Remainer. Um, I have to lead off with that one, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Mrs May's speech, well, um, on, on, on several levels, was very nice. She wants to, you know, she wants to um, keep in place several different security uh, elements with the European Union, which I think... Uh, important. Um, although, what I've noticed is, is that rather conflicts with what you said a few weeks back, um, using the term vassal state about Britain. Uh, and I wonder how you and other members of the Conservative Party can hold both of these ideas in your brains at once. Uh, it seems like 1984 doublespeak to me, and I was wondering if you might be able to fill me in on what you mean by a vassal state. The vassal state was a reference to the proposal that we would have to uh, accept all new EU laws and be subject to the European Court of Justice. Uh, that would be a worse position than we're in currently because we would have no say in these laws. And it would also be worse because the EU would be able to pass laws that we can currently veto. So there are still areas of European regulation 
creation uh, that are subject to unanimity. In the period once we've left, in the transition period, we obviously won't have a vote, and it would be perverse if we had to accept laws that we could currently veto and have therefore stopped in an interim period between uh, the date of departure and the conclusion of the final agreement. That's what I meant by vassal state, and being under the European Court of Justice would mean that our superior court uh, was a foreign court in which we had no representation. Um, I think that's a position we ought to avoid, and is not going to be created by what Mrs May said yesterday. But you think otherwise. Why do you think what she said yesterday will leave us as a vassal state? Well, no, I, I don't think it'll leave us as a, as a vassal state. Um, in that, I, I didn't want well, to... Well, then want we agree. In, ...in the first place. Well, no, this is, this in is the first thing. the first place, yes. But forgive me, I, I just have to get this one in just because yeah, I'm, I'm in a lucky position. To do do to please, I'm yes. ...public television, as radio. But when... <clears throat> You've just said, live on public radio, that the UK had a veto in Europe. Now, that's very, very interesting, because I read so many times in the run-up to the referendum and since that the UK has lost its veto. Now, to hear Well, it you, has uh, lost its veto uh, in many areas. Hmm, has it? Because you... you we've got to deal with this, the... This is the problem, and again, we've got this double speak. On the one hand, you've just no. said, oh, but we'll lose our veto, but then on the other hand, you say we have already lost our veto. Now, I find this one very... Both, both of Which those... one is it? Well, both of those statements are true that we have a veto on tax policy, we have a veto on the multi-annual financial framework, we have a veto on the common foreign and security policy, we do not have a veto on the common agricultural policy, the common fisheries policy, single market regulations. Uh, that veto has been given up successively uh, uh, over the treaties post the Treaty of Rome, but some vetoes still remain. So this is a perfectly consistent point and the key to understanding the European Union and our relationship with it is in the detail and that's where the answer to your question comes uh, but we're going to go from Daniel to Dan Dan you're in Crawley um, and uh, I'd very much like to know your views on the speech of the Prime Minister in, in music Dan are you there yes Jacob I am good morning pleasure to speak to you good morning well thank you for calling um, in that's quite right um, yes uh, I thought Mrs May's speech was admirable actually and I think the the position of our government is, is admirable in this because I feel that Britain, since the, the referendum result came clear, we've been treated with quite a bit of spite and bitterness and contempt by, by EU leaders, particularly the likes of Juncker and, uh, and Barnier. Uh, and I feel that on the issue of security, it could be very easy for Britain because I feel that we, we contribute more than we take. It could have been very easy for our government to, to withhold a lot of security and use it as a, as a bargaining chip and say, you're not going to get this unless we get X, Y, and Z. Um, but, you know, the issue of security affects the, the average citizen, and it's, it's uh, French people and German people and, and Dutch people that would probably suffer more from that. Um, because, you know, in, in these times we live in with terrorism and, and organized crime, it's real citizens that would probably end up losing their lives potentially um, if we took that stance. So I think it's, a, it's an admirable, admirable position because I think that um, certain other people, if they were in charge, might use the position of power that Britain finds itself in in this issue um, to treat the EU with a bit of vitriol in return. Well, I completely agree with you, and I think it's really important that the Prime Minister was generous in what she set out yesterday. I, I think in a negotiation it is right to be generous about the things that you know are in everybody's interests and not to be mean-minded about it and not to use it uh, in a way that would undermine the UK's reputation as a country in favour uh, of law and order and, and stability. So, Dan, thank you very much for, for, for your point. Uh, and I'm now going to go to Gary in Froome. Froome is one of the loveliest towns in Somerset, a really elegant place, so I'm very glad to have a caller uh, from Froome. Gary. Hi, Jacob. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that I'm a massive fan of yours, um, along with many, oh, many you. other people in this country. Um, there's a growing, a growing community of people around here who really believe that you and just a few others uh, are the only people that are standing up and defending this country now. And I mean that. We, we really do feel that the, that the government is not 
doing what we, we voted for. And this country took a massive gamble, a, a hell of a gamble in leaving the EU, and that is why we want to go. We need to go. Now, everybody I speak to, either on social media or um, in the street, up and down the country, they just don't believe now that, that we are going to get what we voted for. Now, Theresa May's speech the other day was fantastic. It was great. I, I, and I'm fair play to her for doing that. But nobody believes that she is going to deliver what we have asked for. It's all smoke and mirrors. It really is. And it's now time that we stop and we get somebody in who, who has this country in its heart, who wants to Give us back what we stand for and we need. And, and you are the only person who can do that, we believe. Uh, you, I know well, it's a huge thing to have on your shoulders. I understand that. But nobody believes in, in Theresa May and in this country's being given what we need. Because every time we turn on TV, we, we see Question Time, which is bias. We see the, the BBC News, which is just lies. Nothing is being done fairly. Well, th thank you for your personal vote of confidence, but I'd have more optimism about where the government is going. I, I actually thought yesterday's speech was really important because it was so clear that out, in fact, means out. It's back to Brexit means Brexit. It has a great clarity about it that we will be taking back control. There isn't any fudge in yesterday's speech. And perhaps in the other bits of the negotiations, there will inevitably be some give and take, some bits that we will accept that we don't want to accept um, in the aim to get a friendly relationship with the European Union uh, at the end of it. So I, I give your vote of confidence to Mrs May. I think she is heading uh, on the right lines uh, and that she understands the power of democracy. D did you see the response she gave uh, to some former German ambassador who said it would be better if you didn't leave? And she said the British people have voted to leave. I thought that was Thatcher-esque in its clarity. Do you agree with that, or you're not reassured? No, oh, he's gone. He's gone. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, it was very nice talking to him. Uh, we've had a text um, asking to explain to a business student uh, what impact a no-deal end result would actually have, which is a very important question. I think we could survive uh, a no-deal because we'd be in charge of our laws uh, and that we would be able to keep sensible things going um, with the European Union. Uh, but we're coming up later looking at uh, UKIP with its request for its seventh leader in 18 months. Henry Bolton was sacked yesterday after party members backed a vote of no confidence. What do you think? Do you think this spells the end of UKIP as a political party? Will Nigel Farage have to come back? Will a new party have to be formed? Should all UKIP members join the Tory party? If you think there's no way back, for, for UKIP, then call 0345 6060 973. If you think they've recovered from a lot worse, then text 84850. Or maybe you think UKIP Mark II will emerge. If so, tweet at LBC. You can watch me on Facebook live from Somerset with a crackling fire in the background. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg. I'm in Somerset to try and lead Britain's conversation uh, today. And we're going to have an interview with Henry Bolton, the former leader of UKIP in a moment. But let's just look at what's happened uh, to UKIP since the referendum, that it's got its seventh leader in 18 months, that after Nigel Farage it seems to have been almost unleadable. Um, Mr Bolton had a vote of no confidence in him by the National Executive Committee, then confirmed by an extraordinary general meeting. They've got a temporary leader in place. The rating of UKIP in the polls has declined very significantly from where it was. And I suppose the questions that arise is, does UKIP now have any great purpose? Has it achieved its main object? Did it, with Nigel Farage in winning the referendum in 2016, do what it had set out to do? Uh, and therefore, does it need to be reformed in a different way? Is it unleadable? Is it so independent-minded, such a strongly held group of individual views that it um, can't be led as an individual party, as a specific party? Or can it come back from its current low rating in the polls, its lack of leadership, and the way it's gone in leadership is, is hard to believe, actually. It's gone through so many 
leaders uh, who have then got into difficulty one way and another. Where do these difficulties come from? Is there somebody trying to undermine it from within? Is there somebody pulling strings that make it very difficult? I, I, I'm hoping Henry Bolton can help us answer some of these questions and can give us a view uh, as to what the future for UKIP is, because even as a Conservative, I recognise that UKIP played a really important role, and obviously particularly Nigel Farage, who I'm standing in for today, in getting the vote that led to us voting to leave the European Union. Without UKIP, that wouldn't have happened. But I just wonder whether history has passed on from UKIP now. Uh, so, Henry Bolton, you're in the London studio, you're in Leicester Square. Thank you very much for joining us this good, morning. Good morning, Jacob. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Thank you. It can't have been an easy few weeks for you. Could uh, you give your view of how things have gone? Yeah, it has been a, a tad bumpy, uh, I'd agree. Um, sort of quite, quite relieved to have a, a slightly quieter day today. I mean, you, you've just asked uh, some extremely pertinent questions uh, with regards to the party, and indeed it was those questions that, in a sense, uh, I wanted the party to, to answer, and unfortunately it's answered in a way that, I, uh, you know, I, I think is quite unfor uh, unfortunate and doesn't help it going forward. Um, the, the question as to whether or not uh, UKIP's jo done its job, well, uh, indeed, um, the... the the great purpose of UKIP was really to bring about that referendum and the decision to, to leave the European Union. But perhaps it hadn't thought forward to what that actually meant, how we translate leaving the European Union into, uh, into um, the, you know, how we convert that into a trajectory coming out of the European Union that actually sets up the United Kingdom in a good way for the future. Um, so, frankly, the, the party dropped the ball after the referendum, and but, it's been rather neglected about, sen since. But what about your role? You mm. became the leader, um, then your personal life intervened. How responsible do you feel personally for what happened to you? Well, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the situation in my personal life... Uh, created an opportunity for uh, those people within the party that, that that had never accepted my leadership in the first place to express themselves. And indeed, uh, again, you ask, ask the question, uh, are there people within the party uh, trying to undermine it? I wouldn't say there are people trying to undermine it, but that disparate group of political views um, that were gathered together under the, the, the large, sort of all-encompassing banner of Brexit um, have, have now... Uh, had an opportunity to express themselves in, in a clearer manner and indeed have been quite are, divisive in doing so. So I think, yes, I created the initial uh, opportunity, but it's been exploited in a, in a damaging way. Um, but how much responsibility do you take? Because it must have been difficult uh, for you and for Miss Marnie being at the centre of this media storm, mm -hmm. but it also has done a lot of damage to UKIP. Do, do you think that in the circumstances you found yourself in your personal life, you should actually resign from the leadership first rather than having to put UKIP uh, through a complicated deselection process. Well, I think, uh, had those messages that um, Jo Marnie had put out been of, of a fully pri a public nature, had she put them into the public domain, and, and a lot of people actually think that she did, but indeed they were historical messages put, put out in a one-to-one -one conversation on Facebook and not in the public domain at all. They were made public later, and Do, indeed were... Does that really matter, whether they're public or <coughs> private? That, don't you think that racist views that are expressed in private are still pretty unpleasant? I, I agree, and, I, and indeed I've said as much, but I think also, um, you know, uh, the, there is a question there as well as to how the party responded to the fact that there are people within the party who have deliberately used this to harm the party um, but by they undermining have used the leadership. It deliberately they couldn't have used it deliberately if it hadn't been written in the first place, could they? Correct, but the two things in combination... Um, have done the harm. It's not one, it's not the other, it's both in... It, it both would have done harm separately, but together, uh, indeed, I think they've created a situation now that is, is, is almost impossible for the party to pull itself out of. And uh, you know, bear you in mind as well that, that, that nobody on the National Executive Committee voted for me in the leadership contest. S ever since I became leader, uh, many of them have, have continued to support failed leadership candidates. And indeed... But almost uh, th that, two 
two-thirds vote against you at the EGM yesterday, so it's not just your enemies on the National Executive Committee. Uh, No, indeed, it's not, but um, there is quite an outcry in the party that this wasn't put to a postal ballot of of all the members. Many people couldn't make it. Um, It's a long way to travel for people, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction about that. But aren't you evading your personal responsibility by trying to blame it onto others, that UKIP is in a mess, in part because of your personal life and information that came into the public domain of an unpleasant kind, and that shouldn't you stand up and take it on the chin and say, effectively, mea culpa? Uh, You know, uh, um, the the, the NEC had a vote of no confidence in me. The constitutional process is that that then goes to an EGM. It went to an EGM so that the members who elected me could decide what what they wanted to do. And that's what what I've done. Um, So, uh, you know, yes, I could have uh, resigned earlier. But you know what? I actually believe that there is a greater job to be done here. And that is that we, as a a party, should be unifying and, and... and putting out the message on leaving the European Union and shaping that debate I, on the trajectory of, dare I say, th- that we come out of it on. You clearly weren't doing that job of unifying. You were clearly dividing. And because the tweets or the, the um, social media comment was racist in nature, it was allowing all the anti-UKIP stereotypes to come to the fore, and that was doing enormous harm to your party, for which you had responsibility. And then you say, well, there's a detailed process... But there's also a very simple process that you stand up and say, I resign, and you could have done that, and that might have helped solve the problem for the party sooner. Uh, Yeah, you you know, I received huge support from across the country, within the party, um, and encouragement to stay on. Those people also have a right to be heard and to be represented. And indeed, you know, um, my whole... But you weren't unifying the the party, were you? No, no, but change is often something that people don't like. But you wanted to unify it. Yes, but, 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 Jacob, what had happened... But but you were dividing it. What what had happened is, in the leadership campaign, I I was elected on a platform of reforming the party. Now, when you try to bring about change within a party, then you, you, you'll know well that there are, there are, there's a great degree of resistance. And indeed, that, that resistance was there. Um, we came to the point where I started talking about reform within the party. And indeed, the, the very unfortunate timing of, and the, of the very unfortunate circumstances around my private life but created a situation that made that very, very difficult indeed. But I shouldn't mean, you therefore have realised you weren't the right person to unite the party? But Isn't you know, that obvious? Anyway, Jonathan Arnold you're, you're MEP, no longer... resigned saying that uh, he felt that the party was not leadable um, because of its <laughs> factions. What I was trying to do was unite them, and indeed I failed in that. Um, and uh, uh, yes, if now I you're... certainly f- fully, fully take some of the blame for that. Now you're not leading the party, are you and Miss Marnie reunited? Is that some unity you've created? Uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we talked about it last night. Um, it's a bit early to say what's what's going to happen in in my private life, life Jacob. Um, I've said all along, and right, well, I'll, I'll let that I'll let that be private. You, you, oh, you, you. You're entitled to a private life, um, so I'll ask you a more political question, uh, and that is: uh, Do you want to see Nigel Farage to return? Is he the only man who can uh, lead UKIP, or the only one of you who can herd cats? Uh, Jacob, I, you know, Nigel is a giant of British politics and particularly around the, the European Union uh, question. Um, but I honestly uh, think that the party cannot be united now. Um, I think so that's very unfortunate. So do you think we need a UKIP mark, a UKIP mark two? Or do you think your Tory-inclined members should just reunite with the Tory party? <laughs> Stop recruiting, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, definitely not. Um, look, I, I, I think um, we will see the party take a quite a lurch to the right now. I think we've seen that already with Gerard Batten's um, uh, comments this morning. The, uh, I think that the, the main bulk of the party doesn't really want to go in that direction. It wants to think about shaping the future of the United Kingdom in a comprehensive manner. Uh, what will emerge in the in the coming days and weeks um we have yet to see but but i suspect strongly that there are a lot of people in the party who are going to be looking around for another political home
Uh, um, do you think after Brexit is complete there will be a role for UKIP or that will be that will be it? Well in a sense that's what this, th- my efforts have been all about. Um, can we to, to, to be able to shape uh, or to, to influence British politics beyond the 29th of March 2019 um, UKIP is going to have to change. Uh, it is a bit of a protest party still at the moment and if it wants to be a serious grown up uh, and, and dominant influence in British politics going forward beyond Brexit, then it needs to change. It has to change. It's not fit for purpose in that respect now. So I rather fear that what happened yesterday is that change was rejected. Um, for whatever okay, other well, reasons, but uh, it's been rejected and it's, it's going, going to, to be weakened to as a result. End there. But can I thank you very much for coming on, that it can't be a great day for you today, and I appreciate your having the courage to put your head above the parapet uh, and talk to me this morning. Thank you, Jacob. Um, you're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage, which is very appropriate because we're discussing UKIP and we just had a chat uh, with Henry Bolton, the former leader of UKIP, one of seven leaders that they've had in the last 18 months, and they're now looking for a new leader. Uh, We're very keen that you should join us in this conversation, so do please call 0345 6060973, text on 84850, tweet at LBC, Or you can watch us live on Facebook, for those of you of great technological sophistication. But we've got a very interesting caller coming in, a former Conservative Member of Parliament for Tatton, uh, a seat that has very interesting Conservatives. It was um, held then by George Osborne and now by the absolutely brilliant Esther McVeigh, one of the finest members of the uh, House of Commons. Uh, But this is Neil Hamilton, who is a leading figure in UKIP, a member of the Welsh Parliament currently. Uh, Neil, hello, how are you? Good morning, Jacob. I'm very well, thank you. Good morning. Are you calling from Wiltshire? I am, yes, at the moment, yeah. That's excellent, because Somerset and Wiltshire have a very long-standing yeah. association since King Alfred defeated the Danes in 879, so Wiltshire callers are very welcome. Indeed, when we have the first King of but all over England, to you. What do you want? and buried locally. Excellent. So um, you've obviously been intimately involved with this. You know exactly what's going on uh, in UKIP. Uh, Do you think this spells the end of UKIP as a political party? No, I think it's a new beginning, actually. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, Henry Bolton, I'm afraid, uh, got into a situation where his private life actually prevented us from talking about the things that really matter, like uh, what sort of Brexit we're going to get and what's the future of Britain after Brexit. And uh, he seems to live in a sort of alternative universe. He thinks that although you're the leader of a political party, you can behave in your private life uh, in a way which uh, can be kept away from public view. Well, you and I know that's absolutely impossible. And he showed no understanding of this at any time in the last month, as a result of which the ongoing carry-on farce of his private life was laundered very, very publicly to everybody's embarrassment. uh, And uh, it therefore got in the way of UKIP articulating what its purpose is now, which is something which clearly we must do. But, Neil, do you think that um, Mr Bolton is a symptom or a cause? If he were the only leader who'd got into difficulties, what you're saying would be very powerful. But he's the seventh leader in 18 months, and when you look through what tripped up the other leaders... um, They were being tripped up for all sorts of extraordinary, simplistic mistakes that you wouldn't expect a professional political party to have in its leadership. So it's not just Mr. Bolton, um, it's all the others. It's it's Paul Nuttall who found things difficult. Uh, I mean, the the names, most of them one forgets, but seven in 18 months. Well, I think that over eggs the pudding, really. Um, the, the problem has been that... Uh, Nigel There's quite a lot of eggs there in the pudding, isn't it? Well, no, but uh, I, I, fundamentally, we've only had one leader since uh, uh, Nigel Farage gave up, and that was Paul Nuttall. We've had a series of interim leaders who, who uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, had to be put in place. But we've only had one real leader since then, and Paul Nuttall, unfortunately, but, uh, he wasn't up to the but job. But you lost but one candidate in a punch-up in the European Parliament. No, but that, that actually... Hey, that no, we weren't quite this... We, we never lost... Candidate. That was a candidate. But you lost a leadership candidate because of punch-up in the European Union. You lost Paul Nuttall yeah, because there were questions no, about the election and all no, sorts of things. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there was no punch-up, actually. That uh, was a complete set-up. Uh, and uh, it, it, the, uh, Mike Hookham, who was an MEP who was accused of throwing the punch, denies that anything ever happened. So, so I, mean, I think we must but I'm not on concentrate simp- on, the rea- on, on the realities of, of this. You know, Nigel Farage was a super-dominant leader, a high, highly dynamic force. Yeah. Uh, no, nobody has had a greater effect than Nigel from outside Parliament since the war. And... He uh, was so dominant that he never brought anybody on uh, to succeed him. And we have struggled in the interim. That's certainly true. And also, we're the victims of our own success, of course, with the result of the Brexit referendum. And UKIP now has to reorient but that isn't, itself into a domestic... But, Neil, isn't situation. that the... Isn't that the key point, that you're a victim of your own success and that the leadership... Fandango doesn't really matter. What matters is that UKIP achieved the vote to leave and it doesn't now have a very clear purpose. And once we've left, it's very hard to see what its role will be at all. Well, not, not at all, because uh, I lead the UKIP uh, Assembly members in Cardiff, and we operate there in a domestic parliamentary context, in the same way as you operate in a domestic parliamentary context in Westminster, as well as the European issue. And you know, we, we are uh, uh, daily uh, uh, saying what we believe on the health service, on education, on the environment, etc., etc. Uh, and UKIP fought the last general election, of course, on a full UK domestic program and we fought the Welsh elections uh, in but May nobody was interested and... dare I say in your in your manifesto at the last election because people were interested in UKIP to get us out of the European Union and what you had to say on everything else was entirely secondary and that's why UKIP's vote um, went down so badly isn't it at the last election because you'd achieved your purpose well, I, I think that's right. A lot of people thought that we'd achieved our purpose, but we do have a wider purpose. Uh, and we, we have a vision of what Britain should be like uh, once Brexit has been achieved. We're the only party that's... Um, uh, let me give you a few examples, can I perhaps to, uh, to explain what, what, what I mean. You know, we're the only party that really believes in tough immigration control. We're the only party that thinks we should scrap most of the aid budget and put it into the health service. We're the only party in Wales that supports grammar schools, for example. We're, we're the only party that wants to scrap green taxes, which are subsidising forests of windmills that are desecrating the countryside. There are all sorts of policies it, that UKIP is, is unique on, which the Conservative Party certainly isn't following us. But isn't there a feeling that you've invented policies to give yourself something to do because you've achieved your main objective and that all these policies are deeply secondary? Well, they're obviously secondary to the overriding objective of recovering our national independence and sovereignty. There can be no more important issue in British politics, I'm sure you would agree, than that. But you know, we will achieve that sooner or later, uh, and then we will concentrate entirely upon... Uh, domestic political issues and foreign affairs, of course, but, but, but principally on domestic political issues. And we do have a, a particular outlook on the world which none of the other parties completely shares or indeed shares at all in, in, in most cases. OK, so you think clearly that there is a continuing role for UKIP and wouldn't accept my suggestion that Tory-minded UKIP members should simply rejoin the Conservative Party. Um, who do you think can lead it? Other than Nigel well, Farage? Yeah. Well, I mean, Gerard Batten, I think, would make a, a perfectly good leader for the longer term. I mean, I don't know who may come forward. I, I'm not going to come forward myself because I've got a full-time job uh, leading the party in, in Wales. But I think that's a, a secondary matter for the time being. Actually, What we need to do, first of all, is, is to fill the gap that you pinpointed a moment ago in, in people's minds about what UKIP's purpose now is. And as I say, we but do you're the one... have a fully costed manifesto on which we stood in the general election, uh, which was very, very different from the Conservative manifesto in lots of important respects. And there are lots of people in UKIP who were previously in other parties, in the Labour Party, and indeed who have never been involved in politics before. So you know, we, we, we are a grassroots movement, very different from established political parties that have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and the Trump phenomenon in, in America was uh, exactly the same as the phenomenon which created UKIP. You know, we, we, we articulate a view which the mainstream established parties cannot do. And you feel possibly that you may be the right man to do it for an interim period before other people are ready to try and steady the ship and bring some uh, calm to a party you see a 
bright future for? Could you be persuaded? Will you announce no, your I... candidature live on LBC? <laughs> well, I, I, the only reason I would do that is for you, uh, uh, Jacob, but I'm not going to. I'd be very grateful. Because, oh. But, but, but uh, because, I mean, I do have a full-time job, in effect, because when the Welsh Assembly is sitting it's four days a week in, in Cardiff, and I do have a constituency which is 75% of the landmass of Wales, and as a party leader, I've got other obligations as well. But I will play my full part as part of a team leadership in UKIP, which is, I think, what we need now. Uh, we need the opposite of what Nigel provided, I think, in the short term. You know, we don't want one super dynamic individual to lead the party because we've got to bring everything together, and we've got a lot of hard work to do to persuade the public that we have a purpose in life post-Brexit. I believe, I believe we can do that. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling in. It's a pleasure to hear from you, and I'm sorry I couldn't twist your arm to throw your hat into the ring. Uh, you're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC, leading Britain's conversation from Somerset. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg, leading Britain's conversation, I'm glad to say, from Somerset, where Somerset leads, the country follows. Uh, I'm standing in for Nigel Farage, and we're discussing UKIP, not surprisingly, in his absence. Um, so you can say what he's, you like, because he's not here to tell you off if you say the wrong thing. You can call on 0345 6060 text on 84850, tweet at LBC. So far, all the bigwigs from UKIP have called in. We've had Mr Bolton himself uh, and um, Neil Hamilton, a former Tory MP, call us. But I thought I'd give you a couple of texts first that we've had um, flooding in to, to the office. One says, Hello, Jacob. As a former UKIP member, I've joined the Conservative Party. So well done to Jules from Leicestershire in the hope of being able to vote in a leadership election. Not so well done, Jules of, Le of Leicestershire, because we've got a leader. Um, and uh, Jules would vote for a pro-leave candidate and doesn't see the relevance of UKIP anymore. Um, but Bill at Gateshead says, Morning, Jacob. No, UKIP is not finished. We need them now more than ever. If Brexit is reversed or diluted, this country will see the biggest protest vote in the country's history. Well, I certainly agree that Brexit must neither be reversed nor diluted uh, and that there would be a huge feeling of disillusionment with our democratic process if the vote of 17.4 million people, the biggest vote in our nation's history, were overturned. But now we're going to go to Alex in Ealing. Um, Alex, very interested to hear if you think this spells the end of UKIP as a political party. Hello, Jacob. Hello. Very good to uh, speak with you. I'm a great fan of yours, actually. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I feel you're, you articulate your points extremely well, and, of course, you rise above the uh, thuggish uh, lefty uh, students as well. I think that uh, gains you a lot of uh, support and um, a lot of admiration. Um, on the subject of Henry Bolton, I've actually left UKIP. I, I left... I, when Henry, I was very disappointed when Henry Bolton was first elected back in October last year um, in the party conference in Devon. I felt that he wasn't the right person for the job, and um, I, nonetheless, I sort of bit my tongue. I kind of wanted to see how well he would do, whether he would make good on his promises to get new party funding. Uh, to b bring in more donors to the party, to um, put forward some very meaty, strong policy uh, policies that people could get behind. Uh, and unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And then, of course, subsequent to that, we've had the whole Joe Marnie scandal, which has been incredibly um, distracting, I think, because it's distracted, as Neil Hamilton said uh, earlier on your show, um, before the break, it's distracted from the core message um, that... UKIP should be putting out there. And yes, UKIP does still, I believe, have an important role to play uh, because, of course, although we uh, have voted to leave the EU, um, the largest vote, as you said, Jacob, in, in, in British history, 17.5 million people voting to leave the EU, uh, we need to now ensure that uh, Brexit means Brexit, Brexit, that it's it, not a meaningless vote, but that people get the vote that... Uh, that they voted for. People did not vote for a meaningless SOP. People, 17.5 million people would not have gone to the polls simply to, uh, you know, vote on something that's meaningless. They wanted uh, us to regain control over our borders, over our fisheries, over our, all manner of um, domestic policy 
uh, areas where at present uh, we've lost. They want us uh, to, the people want us to be able to do trade deals all around the world without being encumbered by the, uh, by the protectionist customs union. Um, I, I mean, you're very much on the same page with all of this, and I think... Uh, well, I agree, I, agree with, I agree with what you're saying. So the question I'd put to you is, do you think that UKIP at the moment needs to be in a state of suspended animation, that its role is basically completed, but it isn't finalised? And that if Brexit didn't go the right way, then there would once again be a role for UKIP. But assuming Mrs May delivers on what she's said, which I expect her to do, that Brexit means Brexit, then UKIP's basically done its job. Is that, is that a fair summary? Uh, no, I don't have the same confidence in Theresa May that you do. And obviously you're a member, a leading MP in the party, so I would expect you to have, or certainly to express that you have full confidence in uh, Mrs May. Uh, I do not. Um, I feel that uh, she is a half-hearted uh, Brexiteer at best. Um, she's a technocrat by nature rather than a states person, not a statesman. I think we have to say statesperson now or something ridiculous. I think we can say um, statesman. Yeah, I, 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 she, she, she doesn't have that um, great leadership, I think, that people seek in a leader. But more concerningly, on Brexit itself, she has, for example, indicated that the European Court of Justice may continue to have a uh, the jurisdiction over the UK after we've left, that is completely unacceptable to us. Obviously, there's the whole issue with the transition period. I don't believe there should be a transition period, that freedom of movement, for example, should end as soon as we uh, leave the EU on, in March. I agree with that, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, so there is um, a great deal that the government, in my view, should be pressurised uh, into uh, changing in terms of its uh, Brexit negotiations, I don't think uh, the government, I don't think, has been um, robust uh, uh, enough but with the EU. Uh, it's, it, we've sort of caved in to far too many of the EU's demands. Uh, and I think that, therefore, UKIP does have a role to play. I always make the point... Well, actually, thank, thank you very much for, for that. I, I, to summarise what you're saying, and some people may hear the crackling fire in the background from where I'm broadcasting, you think that UKIP's there to hold the Conservative government's feet to the fire. That's its main purpose in coming years. Um, I've had a couple of Facebook messages, people watching live on Facebook. Uh, one from Maureen, who joined UKIP because of their common sense policies. I wonder if she still thinks their policies are common sense. And a splendid inquiry from Lucy. Have I been asked by TOF to appear on Made in Chelsea? Uh, no, I haven't. But I have been asked by the Sunday Times to be interviewed by her. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that at some point. Uh, and Andrew, so I said I'd do two, I'll do three, says uh, he doesn't think UKIP have showed them in a very good light. Oh, and Derek. Derek says Conservatives don't want you, Jacob. So there we go, Derek. Thank you for, for that view. It, it's very important we get a range of views. Keeps Ofcom happy. Um, and now I'm going to go to Nathaniel in Dover. So Dover at the um, edge, really, of, of our relationship with the continent, the point where so much trade goes to and fro and people come in and out. So, Nathaniel, you know what's going on. What do you think is going on? Absolutely. To the point I can see Calais from my bedroom window um, is how close we are to France. Um, right. Well, Calais used to be, be English, but we lost it uh, yeah. in the reign of um, Mary Tudor. God, it's going back a few years, yeah. Um, no, it I, is, um, one or two. I'm speaking declaration, by the way. I'm a councillor in Dover District Council, so I'm witnessing firsthand what's going on with UKIP. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually had a UKIP councillor resign last night. Um, and to be honest with you, they, they probably still have a purpose until Brexit has happened, but they've obliterated themselves. They haven't done themselves any favour whatsoever, because Mon, our neighbouring council, Thanet District Council, is the only UKIP-controlled council in the UK. And it's that fractured to the point that half of the UKIP councillors voted against their council leader last month and have put a, a thing of no confidence towards their leader because they rejected the, lo the draft local plan the national government set out um which has caused quite a stir in the area uh, to be fair with you these guys have pressed the self-destruct button a minute farage left after the ref uh, after the last general well two general elections are going now geez um, they've they, they've been on a path of self-destruction and it's 
prevalent to see. I mean, you've had what was it eight leaders in in uh, what a year? I, I, I think seven, but everyone's seven. losing count. Oh, but it, what it, you're it, saying is so interesting. You, UKIP can't get leaders locally, let alone nationally, without having votes of no confidence in them. Oh, it's pretty chaotic, I mean, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're down to in the, when I got elected back in May, just gone in the local elections. UKIP got wiped out in this area, absolutely wiped out. Most of the votes, unfortunately, went to your party, but Selavi. Um, and I, I, it, it's one of those where all of this infighting, all of the controversies that's been across the media, everyone can't be bothered with it, I don't think, and I think people are switching off to it. Um, and I think they did play an important part of the election. I was an undecided up until the day of election, to right. be fair with you, um, because there were so many things to and fro in. Um, and I feel... But which way did you go in the end? I only, about, just about went Remain. Um, and the, okay. the reason I went Remain was actually about well, the security. <laughs> OK, <laughs> which we've settled yesterday, and that was our earlier discussion. But you're listening to Jacob Rees-Mogg on LBC. I'm standing in for Nigel Farage. Hello, it's Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, leading Britain's conversation from Somerset, and in the last quarter of an hour we haven't had any leaders, former leaders or leadership contenders from UKIP uh, call in, uh, which is a pity because we've had a couple of them earlier, or at least one former leader, uh, and um, Neil Hamilton, who leads them in Wales. Uh, we're discussing the future of UKIP, whether it has one at the moment, and we've had lots of messages and texts. You can text on 84850 or call on 0345 6060 And we've had a great text uh, from Andrea in Virginia Water, who says, Hello, Jacob. Firstly, few sounds more reassuring than the crackle of a fire, so keep it fed. Secondly, what I absolutely do not understand is why anyone would want to stay in the EU after the way we've been treated since the vote have asked one simple question to so many people and no one, Remainers included, can come up with a single answer, and that is, why have they, what have they given us to try to get us to want to stay? The answer is always a bemused silence. Well, Andrew, I think you make a very good point, but we're not allowed bemused silences on the radio because everyone then switches it off. And I want to go to Pam in Tunbridge Wells because I want to find out, Pam, if you'll forgive the terrible old joke, are you disgusted? Or what do your, or are your views on UKIP? Pam, are you there? I'm there, and I'm not disgusted at all about UKIP. In fact, I'm very optimistic. Oh, good. Hmm. Oh, good. Only because... What, are your, what, are your, what, what, what do you think its future is? Well, it, it has a future simply because there is a space in British politics, and that space is to speak for the voice of ordinary people in this country, because none of the other mainstream parties are doing that at the moment. The political class has become totally decoupled from ordinary citizens. And, pr and UKIP has... Okay, can I ask you one mm -hmm. question on that? I, Go I've, ahead. I'm always very concerned about this term, ordinary people, because I think it sets up politicians as if they're some priestly caste and that there are out there ordinary people. Don't you think everybody is special in their own way, is important, and that ordinary people, dare I say, it's a slightly condescending way of thinking about British voters? Well, ordinary people are special, and they are individually special. Sadly, the political class don't seem to think that. Good, yes. And have sneered at them, the likes of Anna, um, Emily Thornbury, Gordon Brown. You know, they've all had a pop at the people they're meant to represent. So yes, I I, but I, I do quibble on the use of the word ordinary, because I, I don't think any British voter is ordinary. I, I think they are great individual people. Well, I totally agree with you there, Jacob. But it was And I think this is... Oh, Sadly, good, because I, I, you see, I think that plays in to this, Go ahead. this division between the metropolitan elite and the electors is the phraseology around ordinary people, that what one wants to recognise as a Member of Parliament is that the voters are my employer, they're my boss, they're the people I, I report to, and then you get the relationship between the elected representatives and the electors' right. Well, I think people aren't feeling they are. Do you are agree with that? Well, I think people feel they aren't being mm -hmm. represented properly. And in fact, I think there is a seismic shift in politics across the Western um, globe anyway. And it's, it's along the lines of this citizen of nowhere, citizens of um, somewhere. And I think that's what we're seeing. It, you know, it's been sunlit uplands for, for the citizens of nowhere who have benefited from um, 
freedom of movement, mass immigration, nice cheap nannies, nice cheap lattes. It's the citizens of somewhere who've taken the hit on the whole thing. It's them that have seen suppression of their wages. It's them that have seen that they have had to accommodate the three million people that have come here. No extra housing has been provided for them. It's them that's had to shove over and make way. And it's them that haven't had a voice. Yes. And they haven't had a voice. But you know, these are the arguments no of the referendum. And we've not, but we've now voted to leave. So what does UKIP do next? Right. So we now need to address the situation that... We, we need to go back to where we were and find jobs for people, which, again, has been ignored. We, we've closed down the mines, we've, we've closed down our industry, and no one thought at any time, what are all the people in the northeast of England, what are they going to do? People, the, the Labour government came up with a solution of feeding them with benefits. Well, that hasn't worked, because all you have now is completely decimated communities with massive drug problems. And, and benefit dependent, no one sat down at any point and thought, these good people who built our nation, we're dumping them on the slag heap. What are we going to do with them? What have we got to offer instead? And none of the political parties have come up with an alternative in 40 years. Well, people like Gordon Brown... Pam, are you, going to announce your, are you going to announce your candidature to be leader of UKIP? Because you've got a clear programme, which is more than any of the other leaders have had in the last 18 months. I yeah, think plenty, UKIP plenty probably people. needs you. Well, p- plenty of people. But I'd better go to. Exactly with me. Well, you you put your head above the parapet. I think that's great. So thank you for calling in. Um, and we've had some more messages come in. Uh, Carrie says, uh, Jacob, am I burning uh, EU laws or logs? Um, I confess that they are logs rather than EU laws. But no harm in burning the odd EU law. Uh, and now I'd like to go to Dennis in Bournemouth. Dennis, are you there in Bournemouth, by the seaside? Yes, indeed I am, yes. Hello. Well, welcome. Hello. What do you think the future of UKIP is? Well, I think we've got to stop being distracted by uh, by UKIP. Um, they are a spent force, but the interesting thing, there is a job that was done by UKIP, and that's a job that still needs to be done. So it needs to be done by another organisation. Now, we've got... Leave Means Leave, which you're a member of. You've got your European Research Group. Um, we've got the Campaign for an Independent Britain and so on. But all these are disparate organisations. We need a constituency-based campaign. We mustn't forget that 600 out of the 650 constituencies, 65% of them, 420, voted to leave. So we do need an organisation, but it needs to be not... Um, the Tories doesn't need to be Liberal or Labour, it needs to be cross-party. And we need someone... Would this be a movement, a movement or a political party? It will be a campaign, a movement. A campaign group, like Vote Leave or Go? Well, they need to be coordinated. At the moment, um, Remain is dominating the debate. Um, We've also got this um, bombshell sitting down the road, the meaningful vote um, in Parliament, which could scupper um, Brexit altogether, and what we need. Well, I don't. Is I don't think it can actually. I think the meaningful vote is either that we leave with a deal or without a deal. I don't think it can reverse the referendum. That's certainly not in the legislation, and we'd I have to rejoin. I really want to go into that, that, Jacob. What, what I'm right. saying is, what I'm saying is that there needs to you be want a, a movement. unified campaign, and okay. we need someone to lead it. Now, well, I want to get in one more caller before we have to go to the news. So. Thank you for that. And can I go to Linda in Basildon? Linda, are you there? Yes, I am, Jacob. We're very pleased to hear the voice of Basildon, which was so important in the 1992 general election. So, Linda, what's your view on UKIP? Um, I think it's disappointing that since Nigel Farage um, left, UKIP have um, basically focused on internal shenanigans instead of um, putting together a clear program uh, you know of direction of travel post um post winning the referendum yes we did secure the leave vote uh, but what we should have been um sort of focusing on almost immediately is what kind of post brexit um britain um we w- we would like to see and um, it's some, um, you know, basically I feel like we've thrown away. It's been a lost opportunity 
Um, and until such time as they readdress that issue, uh, reform, professionalise, uh, put their policies together, um, then the 2% in the polls for UKIP um, won't be heading in the, uh, in the up direction any time soon. Well, thank you very much. That's a very helpful view. The voice of reason from Basildon. And I just wanted to read out a view uh, from the New Forest, where the two wonderful MPs, Desmond Swain and Julian Lewis, represent strong uh, Brexit views. But this is from Ian Linney, who says, I and many other UKIPers believe that Mr Bolton is a Lib Dem saboteur, a party he belonged to. His plan to finish off the party, now Mr Bolton has been ousted, hopefully UKIP can move forward again. Um, that's an interesting view. This is Jacob Rees-Mogg. I've been standing in for Nigel Farage.